Hello there, I'm Elizabeth Day. I'm a journalist, author and broadcaster. And almost three years ago, inspired by the learnings of what I believed to be my many, many failings in life, I started a podcast on that very topic, failure. The How to Fail with Elizabeth Day podcast features inspiring people talking about three times they failed in life and how learning from those failures ultimately helped them grow. Somewhat ironically, How to Fail has actually become one of my biggest successes. The podcast now has over 16 million downloads and I've written two best-selling books on failure. All of that prompted one journalist to call me the poster girl for failure. I'm not entirely sure it's a compliment, but I'm still pretty proud of it because it's in that capacity that I've been asked here by Pinterest today. As the place where people come to find inspiration and try new things, Pinterest, like me, believes it's time to reframe failure and instead to celebrate the art of trying. Inspiration at its heart is about creating the urge to act, making you want to do something or try something or be something just a little bit different than you are today. And of course, trying new things will inevitably sometimes even, well, often lead to failure, at least at first anyway. The truth is, all of us fail in myriad ways almost every single day. And yet we live in an age where it seems as if everyone else is nailing their life. We're surrounded by the curated perfection of social media, by filtered photos and celebrity videos. The endless scrolling through other people's seemingly picture-perfect lives can be exhausting and also a bit lonely sometimes. But in real life, as on Pinterest, you'll be surprised by where even the most epic fails can lead you, especially when you open yourself up to fresh ideas and to trying new things that you never thought you could do. Failure becomes a stepping stone in our journey. It becomes part of our story. And so with that in mind, I am delighted to be joined here today by a truly inspiring female leader from within the media industry. As country manager for one of the biggest ad markets in the world, for the biggest advertising agency in the world, WPP's Karen Blackett has certainly achieved an awful lot. She's also non-executive director for the UK Government Cabinet Office and has topped the list of the most influential Black Britons, being the first businesswoman ever to achieve the accolade. Welcome, Karen. It is so exciting to have you with us. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. I am really looking forward to this. I really am. Me too. And I outlined there your incredible achievements, but I'm sure that being one of the UK's most inspirational leaders didn't come easy to you. So what failures have you dealt with on the path to your eventual success? What do you think the major stumbling blocks were for you at the time? Look, I think every day is filled with some form of failure where things didn't go exactly how you wanted them to. Um, and look, I took a while to get to where I am and I did that via zigzagging in my career. And I zigzagged and did lots of different roles and by doing lots of different roles, I learned what I was good at. I learned what I needed to be part of or where I needed to be part of a team. I learned about my strengths and weaknesses. So I think throughout my career, there's been, you know, the pitches we didn't win, the clients we lost, you know, the people that have been amazing and talented that have gone elsewhere. So I think all of those things you learn by, and that's professionally, let alone everything that goes on in your personal life at the same time. Tell me, I heard a rumour that you actually started out as an athlete and did a bit of a pivot. <laughs> well, in there's a time. failure. <laughs> there is a failure. I, I am here as a failed athlete because that was my first love. And the, the team at the agency are bored with my stories of my athletics days because I try and weave them in to any sort of conversation that I'm having with everyone at work because I did learn from it. I did learn about, you know, how to be focused, how to practice, how to do things over and over and over because I was a sprinter and I could win the 100 metres if I got a really good start because I'd stay ahead. Um, and, you know, that I'd, so I'd practice and practice my start on the starting blocks the whole time. 
I was part of a relay team and I was always the third leg or the first leg on the relay team. And again, I would practice the handover. So I think that athletics and sport has taught me about focus. It's taught me about being disciplined. It's taught me about practice. But that's also helped me with failure as well. When you don't get the personal best that you wanted, when you haven't run fast enough to qualify for the team, the relay team, or to qualify to, you know, to go through the heats and go into the 100 metres for your athletics team or your university, it, it, it taught me about failure as well as success and how to, each time you win, you know, what I do now is take that moment to celebrate because when I was an athlete, it was all about the next event and the next competition. And you didn't take the time to take stock and realise what you'd just done. Now I do. So it's about having self-compassion, but also discipline. Is that right? Totally. Absolutely. Because we're all too hard on ourselves. And if last year taught us anything, it's not to be so hard on ourselves. We can't have the perfect working environment when you're working from home. I don't know if you can hear, but my dogs are going mental upstairs. And that's okay. It's literally not to be hard on ourselves and to have, you know, those take time to celebrate those little moments of success that we have during the working day and working week, as well as learnings from the failures as well. I know that you are incredibly inspirational, not just professionally, but because personally you're a single mum. Yeah. And I wonder how you have managed to juggle all of those roles, like how to be a director in business and a director in your personal life. Look, I don't think anybody has got this nailed. Nobody has got the perfect solution and have got the plan for managing it all. I just don't believe that because we all do what we can when we can. And again, you know, that's part of those little failures that tend to happen. You know, if childcare fails, it literally will impact the rest of my working day. But you have those coping mechanisms and you have things in place to help. And I talk a lot about work-life blend. I worked with an amazing woman called Anna Rasmussen, who runs a company called The Open Blend Method. And she was the one that introduced me to the idea of blend. It's not about balance. There's not a winner and a loser, because when it's work-life balance, something wins and something has to lose. Whereas blend, work is life and life is work, and it's about how you blend the two. And I try as as best I can to blend work. So can I just ask you quickly, because I know so many parents are struggling with homeschooling right now. And you've just identified something really brilliant, I think. Blend, not balance. What would you say to someone who feels harassed and like they're failing at their job and failing as a parent right now? Do, do you know what? It, it is so, so difficult because... I know whatever I say, people are still going to think I'm not doing a good enough job. And I, I you know, I'm saying this to the people in, in my agency and in my company. We have work. We have a home. Our kids are fed. That's a win. I mean, it's literally a win and everything else is a bonus. So, you know, if a piece of work gets handed in late, it's handed in. It's late let's not kill ourselves over it. If your kid is eating chips and beans for five days in a row, he's got or she's got food. It's all right. It, you know, we can make up for it in another time. So we just need to do what we can to get through and not try and emulate perfection. Done is better than perfect. It's literally, let's not try and emulate perfection because we will be constantly constantly disappointed. Okay, so I want to bring it back to our wonderful hosts for a moment. And as you know, people use Pinterest as a place to escape, to plan ahead and visualise their future. I know that you and I aren't big fans of five-year plans, which is why a Pinterest mood board is so much better. So imagine, Karen, that you get to escape from the now. Gosh, we all want to do that. Um, you get to plan and to visualise and to build a blueprint for the future of the advertising industry. Tell me what the future looks like for you. I So my Pinterest board for the future of the advertising industry is far more colourful than it is now. Um, for sure, because 
we're a little bit monochrome at the moment, uh, our industry, and I can see in the future with everything that happened last year, uh, you know, I, I generally think that so many people really learn more about their personal values and organisations learn about their company values. And my Pinterest board for the future is actually action and living those values. So it is far more colourful. It is far more diverse. It is far more interesting and it's more vibrant and creative because of it. Um, so I can see more people from different backgrounds coming together to come up with the best creative ideas. I can see people less worried about privacy and data issues because as an industry, we've come together to have collective responsibility and reassurance. And I can also see lots of newer companies as well coming together in the future because there's room for more innovation and there's room for more companies that sort of, you know, change the course of the industry and shape the industry. So I'm optimistic about what the board looks like going forward. I love that mood board and hopefully it also contains lots of lovely bosses who are like you um, <laughs> because one of the things that I wanted to ask you about is that not everyone has an understanding mm. boss or line manager. So when it comes to being honest and open about your failings at work, what advice would you give to them? Yeah, look, it, it's so difficult because I, I genuinely believe that the best leaders I've worked for are the leaders that show vulnerability. And I think I've been fortunate in working with leaders that not only are creative, not only are smart, but show that they're human. Um, and, you know, if we haven't achieved something, if we haven't won something, if we haven't done something as we should have done, we do do a deep dive analysis on it. And we do understand, you know, why, what could we have done better? You know, feedback is a gift. I genuinely believe feedback is a gift. Learn from the feedback. And I've been fortunate that I've managed to work with leaders that are like that. And that's helped shape who I am as a leader. I have worked with leaders that aren't. I really have. And people leave managers. They don't leave companies. I always think it's best to try and have a discussion, to try and have a conversation and to communicate how you're feeling and how it affects you know, your performance, if you don't feel that you're in a space where, you know, a leader or a manager is getting the best out of you, try and have that conversation. And they should see feedback as a gift. And yeah. if you ask people for help as well, sometimes when you ask for help, people are totally unaware that you're not managing or that you're not happy or that, you know, you're finding things difficult, maybe totally oblivious and just the mere act of asking for help or asking for time or asking for a conversation can make a difference. And if that then doesn't change things, leave. Is it true that you studied geography and that you didn't actually know what a media agency was when you were first applying for jobs? Yeah, I look, I grew up in uh, Reading in the 70s and I loved the TV ads as much as I loved the TV programs and I wanted to be in that world and look my mum and dad first generation immigrants from Barbados they wanted myself and my sister to be a doctor or a lawyer or an accountant bitter failure because I didn't do any of those things and I was able to sort of go into this world of advertising but I had no idea what the industry was I knew about an ad agency I didn't know what a media agency was. And I was applying that bit about rejection that we talked about earlier. I applied for role after role after role at client companies on the marketing side, at advertising agencies, and got rejection after rejection after rejection because I didn't fit the mould. And so, you know, there was an ad in the independent newspaper for a media auditor. Wasn't quite sure what that was. Um and I applied for it and it was within a media agency and it's through applying for that role, I was referred to a different part of the agency and that's how I got in. So I didn't know about the makeup of the industry. I knew no better. I had nobody in this world that could help me navigate my way in. So I eventually found my way in by zigzagging. I mean, that is an incredible example of failure as data acquisition. 
And <laughs> you sit here before us and you're such an inspiration to listen to and to learn from. And I suppose my final question is really what success means to you. Do you feel like a success? Do you know what? For me, success is happy clients. Uh, it, it's a company that's growing and it's being able to influence. So I'm really not bothered about titles. I'm really not. But what I am bothered about is the ability to influence uh, and for people to listen. So for me, success is, you know, creating dynamic, diverse workforces that produce brilliant, creative work. That is such a wonderful note to end on. And thank you so much for sharing your incredibly inspiring story, but also for encouraging us all to be a bit more compassionate and to try things out just as we do at Pinterest. Try things out and you never know what might lie in your future. Thank you so, so much, Karen, for talking to me about how to fail. It's been a pleasure.